Hello there and thank you very much for taking the time out to watch this video. My name's Richard Arundel and this is just a pre-word before I share the content of a meeting that I had with the Cornwall Astronomical Society on the 26th of November 2020 and I've done this video with the express permission from their board and attendees were notified that this would be recorded for YouTube purposes. So my name is Richard Arundel and I'm a spacecraft engineer based in the southwest in Plymouth and I can just about see Cornwall over the river so I'm almost in Cornwall but not quite. Um, my area of research is on-orbit manufacture which is the idea of building spacecraft in space, um, literally like an orbiting factory if you like and um, that's what I'm going to go through today, a very brief introduction and we'll go from there. Okay, so what I'm going to cover then, what the concept of on-orbit manufacture is, what we could actually achieve if we were capable of doing this in reasonable scale, and then a very rough outline of the technology roadmap that my research is going through. Okay, so at my, my little uh, one-liner, as I like to think of it, is the spacecraft, building spacecraft in space. And the idea of it is that we want to manufacture space-qualified structural components with the idea being that if you can build something simple, like a strut, then you could build more of them, put them together to create a truss. And then when you've got a truss, you can build almost anything. And we'll come back to that because this is where it ties in the whole astronomical side of things. So there's got a few names out there in the cosmos. Um, On-orbit manufacture could be OOM, that's the abbreviation I use, but there's also on-orbit servicing and OSAM, which is basically o OSAM is everything, which is your servicing, your assembly and your manufacture, whereas your on-orbit servicing is just that. So I'm looking at the manufacture side mostly, but OSAM as a wider area as well. So if we were able to do this in like reasonable scale, because there are some missions that are launching as early as next year that want to start doing this and not just 3D printing on the ISS, but actually looking at building structures. So we could actually look at infrastructure for colonizing and gaining resources. So for example, we could start looking at moon bases and space mining or asteroid mining, um, colonization, building habitats and space stations, that sort of thing. Um, the support capability where I think it ties in here will be telescopes and antenna reflectors. And as Colin was saying with the very large telescope, you know, you've got these enormous antennas and, um, and telescopes on earth. But what if we could build something enormous actually in space, bypass all the attenuation from the atmosphere and clouds and all that? Uh, you know, and what if we could build something enormous? How, you know, what could be achieved? What could we get from that? I think that would be quite exciting. And then, of course, the last one, the interstellar exploration side of things. So this is concepts of literally traveling to other solar systems, galaxies. But these are all very blue sky thinking and science fiction realm, if you like. But... There's, there's a lot of thought still being out there and there's genuine research being done on actually looking at these um, areas. So it's not just complete science fiction, there's actual science being done in this. So very briefly then, just to wrap it up mostly, um, my technology roadmap then. So the idea is to have concept and requirements, look at what we're doing. Um, the three main areas for me is manufacturing method. So how are we gonna build these things? How are we going to handle material and acquire it? So whether that's space mining or how do we get material from Earth up into space and then do something with it. We've then got to validate and make sure what we've built is good. So what does good look like? That ties back in the requirement. And then what would be nice idea, which is what I'm hoping to do with the whole Southwest and engaging in bringing this, um, more of the space industry down here, potentially looking at building a laboratory prototype and actually launching something perhaps in the next 5, 10, maybe 15 years to actually demonstrate this along with all the other missions being done by European Space Agency, NASA and so on. We basically looked at what on-orbit manufacture is, what we could actually achieve if we were capable of doing this, and a potential technology roadmap. I do have a YouTube channel, which is where I upload lectures. So everything I've been talking about, I talk about more in sort of 20 to 25 minute lecture videos. Uh, by all means, please come along and view them and get involved with discussions. I do open forum where I actually encourage people to get involved, tell us what you think, some of the more political side like space mining or recycling. 
Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, so by all means, please connect with me on there and get involved with the network and see what's going on. Uh, a Facebook page as well. Um, by all means, catch up with there. And of course, I have a website. By all means, come and visit and see what's going on in there. And with that, thank you very much for listening. And that'll be the end of my segment. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Richard. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. I really didn't expect anything like that this evening, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to be, um, you sort of talked about doing sort of 20, 25 minute segments. I'm just wondering if sometime next year you might um, do a return visit to us if you don't, yeah, you'd be more than welcome to be a member with us, but um, perhaps give her give us a full of session sometime next year. If there's interest, I'd be more than happy and would be delighted to. Right, so that's the end of the official meeting. <coughs> so now it's kind of a free for all for anybody who wants to stay. Thank you very much for your chats. It's been wonderful. Some of those talks have been brilliant. Richard, do you see Richard there somewhere still? Yes, you are. Hey, what did you think of the way that, uh, yeah, our Zoom meeting? Yeah, that was really good. And um, thank you for uh, allowing me to join in tonight. Um, there was lots of really good points. And um, one thing I thought with Natalie actually said about the whole, um, with the lunar side of things, um, they're talking about the lunar regolith, more segueing into more what I do, but they're actually looking at how um, with the lunar samples, how it's actually made up of on its composition, because what they want to do is they want to use it and use it as building blocks for potential moon colonies. And there's a process called sintering where um, if you imagine like how we make concrete on Earth, they kind of want to do that with moon dust, bind it with other materials and basically make like igloos because it's very good for radiation shielding. Um, so they're looking at doing things like that as well with uh, actual moon dust. So in my world so i thought i'd uh, um segue that in a little bit there with your talk but yeah it's um yeah lots of good stuff they're still definitely studying uh lunar samples even today yeah, yeah, on that, on that, oh sorry natalie you go so you, you sorry go. no you carry on <laughs> no, i was just gonna say for if, if there is a really good ted talk i watched a couple of days ago on exactly that subject and it was these little automated like bots that um, they, they put down on the moon. They blow up an inflatable dome and these little things carve up the regolith and then and build, build, dump it in layers on top of the, uh, the inflated um, dome. Uh, mm. I, think they was, I thought they said something about microwaving it, Richard, or, or somehow firming it up. And, mm. and this might take months, you know, these little, these little bots just sort of go about their job and, and, and if one of them breaks down, who cares? Because they're AI and they all sort of work together. And at the end of it, you've got a sort of a building so it was really so if you search on the ted ted it was a really good ted talk on it um hmm. that was very interesting yeah they do there's there's loads of weird and wonderful and wacky ideas out there for using um, materials for building things in space like another one is um that they've just released as a company called nanorax and what they want to do is you know the launch stages from rockets when they send satellites up well, not all of them end up coming back to Earth. They actually stay in orbit. So you've got the debris problem. And what they've come up with is you've got these empty launcher stages and they actually want to repurpose them to make things like hydroponics and grow plants and things in space or use them as like actual modules and recycle them. Um, but you've got all sorts of law and policy issues there because uh, um, because then it's like, well, is it like um, like international waters? If you claim a wreckage, is it like um, not quite piracy, but does it count as treasure? You know, like when you go deep sea diving, who the first person claim it, but then does the original owner still have jurisdiction because it's their rocket? And so th there's lots of it's not quite as simple as that but there's um yes yeah, really weird and wonderful things going on out there and asteroid mining to link in with like the lunar side of things as well you know using um geology from other worlds to do weird and wonderful things but along those principles a lot being done and thought about yeah. oh hi, hi, Greg. Yep. yeah hi richard uh christine is asking if you if you think computers and machines will be making these materials like the concrete or we or are we planning to send earthlings to do it um there's a lot of work being done in autonomous ai um for exactly that because one part of it is yes sending a man up with a machine 
um, and you know you've got it in space operating machinery but for if we're looking at larger concepts then we're definitely looking more like robotics and that's incredibly complex because even just docking with um, you know like with SpaceX of recent docks of the International Space Station that's already incredibly complicated and dangerous just doing that uh, i mean it's not just as easy as oh they line up match up and off they go so aligning robotics to build these structures um and building things is incredibly complex um you've got on one hand loads of advantages of the building in the space environment uh, you can build structures that you couldn't build on earth but then you've got different problems with radiation solar wind um on the spacecraft there's all sorts of mechanical things so definitely robots have to be um, used for the bigger projects longer term. I'm looking at it as thinking, you know, a bit of futurism, thinking about what we can do as the human race, do we get to a certain point? Um, raising space awareness in the Southwest, especially, but also in general, and um, teaching the next generation of engineers and scientists. And the work that I do on orbit manufacturing, it's almost every discipline you can think of in science and engineering can be involved with it somehow whether it's robotics mechanical engineering electrical even like i said with biology if people want to build gardens and grow food in space for long duration well how are you going to build a greenhouse or build a habitat for it okay we need biology so you do you need almost every profession uh, you know it, it takes a group and you you hit on the point that it takes um a lot of different people from different areas to be able to do this now mm. it actually if you look down on earth we have got such a diverse amount of things from the guy who runs the grocer's shop to elon musk who sends up you actually need everything you need right the way down to hairdressers you know doctors nurses you need everything to make a civilization okay yeah. and that's all yep, absolutely. civilization makes everything you know um and mm. for interstellar travel or travel you know interstellar you know outside mm. of the earth should i say we have to build up to a point where you've got everything you know and it's ex exactly the same what well, um interested you say that because one of the videos i've got on my youtube channel a bit of se shameless self-promotion here but actually talking about that exact concept because i know i'm a part of another group an initiative for interstellar studies and they've actually done the math on when could we build these what they call world ships as in literally replicating earth but in spaceship form and it's like hundreds of kilometers long you know what i mean it's ridiculous it's um you, you know they're looking at maybe in the year 3000 we could do this and the numbers that they're talking about it's something like if we were to start now with the world's gdp and economy if everyone chipped in it would still take us 700 or so years to equal the point and the resource and the financial cost just to build one of these things and then you've got like the interstellar voyage or that but when you think numbers like that it's just not in our lifetime um oh. and the nearest the nearest thing they've got is things like if we can find a way to build a large enough say spacecraft then you might have generational starships where families and colonists would go they would be born there live there and die there on the ship that would travel through the stars and build as you go and things like that um, and this has genuinely been thought about and in one of the videos i've got i touch upon um, some of the work that's been done and provide other links for anyone who's interested in that sort of far out way beyond futurism <coughs> well that's right i mean the human race has to do it at some stage whether they can do it by the year 3000 i i you know i think that um we're very slow really and time is ticking because something will happen at some stage and we never know when that thing will happen we like to think we know but we don't all it takes is one asteroid to come towards us and that's the end of all of us mm -hmm. and the only way that we can survive as a um as a race is to go into outer space and we'll mm -hmm. start off at the moon and then mars but it will accelerate yeah. uh, um, you say three thousand. you know we went we went to the moon i know there's a long distance you know 50 years since we you know went to the moon but the next step is we'll go to the moon again and then we'll go to mars and then we'll go and it'll get faster and faster so the the problem is one something that mick brought up really is distance people don't understand the real distances that you need to go 
mm. I got a, um, a petit pois pea and put it on my uh, table. This was about five years ago. And I wanted to calculate if that was our sun, okay, not the earth, but our sun, where would the next P have to be to be, if it was relational in size, you know, mm. where would the next P have to be um, to be the next nearest star? Ah, okay. it, it, it interesting you mentioned that because uh, talking about Alpha Centauri there again. Yeah. There's this been there's a study been done on it because I was part of a team. I want to say five or six years ago that looked at a concept for this. And long story short, they calculated uh, under normal engines that we've got now, it's about a ten thousand year journey, which is ridiculous. Um, but what they've looked at is that if if we had the capability to accelerate to um, 10 percent the speed of light over x amount of years because they want to use a laser sail concept so literally That's imagine right, a yeah. space sail accelerate for 10 years to 10 percent of speed of light cruise for about 80 years and then decelerate at the other end once you approach the alpha centauri binary system um, then you can get captured in gravity wells lagrange points that sort of thing magnetic tethers um, then they proposed a, a concept for a hundred year journey to Alpha Centauri, but you've got to accelerate, you get that acceleration first and so forth. But and unfortunately that, that was only calculated with the, um, with a sail, wasn't it? And mm. not with the cargo which would go on board, which includes us or robots or whatever. So it's mm. ridiculous. But if you've got a pee on my, on my um, desk upstairs, um, the desk has moved actually, so there was about six different uh, six meter difference from where it was. But the next P, which would be Alpha Centauri, would be in Gloucester, mm. yeah. and that's the distance. If the, if if you if you look at the you know have them relational, uh, people don't realize that's our nearest one. That's mm. not a good one. Okay, no. <laughs> it's our nearest one. You know, it's, uh, it brings it to light a little bit. No, it's, it's an interesting thing. I mean, I'm very, very interested in sending up something up into space, actually. Um, and I've got this just to, just to show you. This is my starting point. Um, I don't even see this at all. But I've decided that at some stage I want to do a... Um, uh, this is just full of different types of electrical bits to go into its Arduino based okay so i've got an arduino there um and loads and loads of different sensors and things and the idea is i want to build a satellite um the, the problem is most people who want to build a satellite know what they want to build and then it's a case of how do they build it i have absolutely no idea what i want to build but just want to learn all the little bits and i've picked up loads and loads of videos of other people who've actually sent these cubesats into space and things like that um, yeah. So if anybody's got any ideas of what I can actually build and program, then, you know, please say. Obviously, I'd like to do a telescope, mm -hmm. but it's low Earth orbit. And uh, if you can do a telescope, you really want it out there somewhere mm -hmm. and lasting for a little bit longer than, you know, a month or so. But Well, one of, one of the concepts I had where I mentioned in the slide about, um, you know, a, a building a telescope as a potential product for on-orbit manufacture, um, that's one of the concepts I'm looking at. Um, I've considered perhaps parking it in a Lagrange point, so you're just out of the way somewhere, but nice and stable. I've always thought it'd be a great idea to drop a uh, an observatory on the dark side of the moon, which of course isn't the dark side of the moon, it's <laughs> the light side, um, which means it can be powered nice and easy. <laughs> um, well, any, anywhere on the moon could be, but it'll be a static thing there. Um, and uh, yeah, I've always thought about doing something like that. There's so many things you could do. I have noticed a question in the chat from Christine. Um, this raises huge ethical questions, intergenerational starting out and colonizing. Is ethics involved in any of these initial talks for Richard or anyone? Um, I, I would say I, I'm quite happy to open that to listen to what everyone else thinks, but to get the ball rolling. Um, Yes, absolutely huge ethical studies. And what I'll do is while someone else perhaps has provides their opinion, I will link um, in the chat basically um, what one of the studies by a colleague who in 2020 goes for all this interstellar work and provides like budgets and ethical discussion. And it's free to download. It's a journal. Um, it's from the Arc Vix um, side of things. So after I finish talking, I'll put that in the chat. 
And um, yeah, what does everyone else think about interstellar travel and generational world colonizing? I'll open it up. I think that the breakthrough Starshot project's quite interesting if it ever gets done, you know, where they're going to fire, use the light sails and fire these tiny, you know, hundreds of these tiny little cameras at Alpha Centauri. I think, is it about a 25 year turnaround? They, I can't, I can't remember the details of it, but um, that, that's quite interesting. I mean, they're not going to be able to stop when they get there. They just can take snapshots of the system as they go through. But that would be that would be really fascinating, and that's probably a good good place to start, isn't it? And see see what's there. But personally, I don't think I'd want to um, spend my life on a generational ship. It'd have to be pretty, you know, like you said, Richard. It would need to be kilometres along and and look mm -hmm. a bit like Earth because you know you're giving your life up, aren't you? You know, and if you were born on one, you might be a bit resentful and think, well, hang on a minute, you know, I don't really want to live in a tin can uh, all my life. It's um, yeah. Uh, then, of course, the other side of it is if you were born on a spaceship and couldn't go anywhere, do you know any different to True. have an opinion? You know, the, uh, the, there's definitely there's a whole ray We've of discussions. Watch, and watch the videos, you know, and think, well, why did you do this to me? I could have been there, you know. It's <laughs> like human race likes history. Um, it's one of the things that we, we go by is by history and one of the things that have made us grow, really. Um, if you were on a generational ship, they would teach you about Earth, and mm. that must be for for them absolutely gutting. Yeah, mm. it would be, in, wouldn't it? In in that paper, I've linked a paper in the chat, and I've seen some more questions come up. Um, the the paper I've linked, they actually talk about skill degradation because if we're tying back to what we said about um, automation and like robot AI building and and maintaining systems. Um, mm. Their, their concern the concern is that after a few generations you lose skill sets like your mechanics and engineers well if right. you've got robots that can build other robots and maintain themselves mm. do they need to know the engineering so would they lose skills that is a question as well yeah um, if you like ethics and skill retention yeah I mean, the other interesting thing is augmentation of ourselves as with robotics, like, you know, like Neuralink, Elon Musk's, you know, Neuralink uh, company, you know, uh, I've heard it, you know, some of the pundits are saying, you know, we're, we're one of the last generations of true humans that, you know, in, in generations to come, humans will look completely different. They're going to have, you know, perfect memories. We're going to augment ourselves in all kinds of ways and it'll be a slippery slope. And, and if we did meet other creatures or, or entities from from beyond the earth, then it's quite likely they could be uh, non-organic in nature. Mm. I think the ethics piece, you have to decide why you really want to do it. You know, if it's it's to if it's to live, if it's to leave a dying planet, then maybe the ethical mm. considerations are different from tourism. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Oh, it's the survival of species eventually, isn't it? Mm. Well, to Fred's point about you know an asteroid hitting us, we, we're going to be insured against that if we go if we colonise the Moon and Mars, and maybe some of the asteroids, bigger asteroids in the asteroid belt. Then, you know, um, we're going to insure. I mean, it's something that's going to wipe out the solar system, take a black hole or something like that is. Well, I don't know. I presume it's very. I hope it's very unlikely. Well, but, the sun, um, yeah. sun itself is going to expand and, and you know to the Earth's or, uh, orbit, isn't it? At some point, you, you got yeah, you got four thousand five hundred million years for that, yeah. and you so it's quite so a lot. We would have yeah. um, migrated, wouldn't we? We'd certainly have time to build Richard's um, generational ship in in that time. <laughs> if we have, and it's the end of the human species, isn't it? True. Uh, that's the option, isn't it? If you do nothing, the, the species is doomed, isn't it? Which really isn't a bad point in itself, because things do come and go. We're here because other species have died out, and we're here because other planets have blown up. We're here because of supernova. Now, that's, a, you know, the next thing, really, if there's a supernova that's fairly close by, mm. um, you know or the effects of a supernova because you do have sometimes have you know jets of um uh, i don't know what they are but, but coming out you know um there are things that that could happen they're very very unlikely the most likely is probably an asteroid coming to us 
Yeah. Gamma ray burst. Oh, I think. Yeah, so gamma ray burst. Yeah. Right. Well, um, going back to the chat then, so Natalie uh, asked a question about um, mining of asteroids in the moon and how active are companies and countries looking to pursue this and are there any laws or ethical guidelines in place? Uh, yes, there are companies who are genuinely interested in this. Um, and or because material acquisition is important, well, all throughout history, when people have like conquered other countries, it's basically about resources and land. There's lots of things like outer space treaty and, and different parts of the world see space differently, like in Europe. And the European Space Agency have unanimously said, we see space should be explored for the good of mankind, science, all these good things. We could claim these juicy spots on the moon because there's certain craters. There's one that's very close to a terminator and it's basically an optimal point where you can get permanent sunlight and it provides good radiation shielding. So basically you could get 100% power from solar panels and things like that. And with the sort of, you know, oh, water on the moon and things like that, basically they're, they're starting to think, well, is this like prime real estate in space? And of course, everyone else is going, well, you can't just claim space, you know, what's going on here? Um, and I think a few people high up in government and other places are starting to think, actually, this might become an ethical and political issue down the line. Um, if you think about colonists in America, oh, we've landed in America, great. Okay, let's all go west and in the gold rush and things like that. And then, the, you know, it's that, but in space, there is genuinely a lot of ethics and space law being thought about this and how can we do it? And on a different side of it, looking at the practical, how is it worth doing it at the moment? The cost of launching into space, getting to the moon, bringing the materials back, doing it you know the is it what is it bang for buck is it resource acquisition that's another thing that sort of you know tempers the mood but um if you could have a, a, a you know a facility on the moon or on orbit manufacturing or a factory and cut down your logistics that reduces complications financially and um physically but ethically kind of worms i mean luckily space is very very big if you yeah. want to try and own a piece of space, then good luck because, you know, <laughs> um, but if people do, I mean, if the American, let's face it, the Americans are the best people to get up into space. Okay. The Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, the, the French, um, at the moment we're doing it in such a small amount, it won't make any difference whatsoever. And I think even if we get to the point where we do it in such a large amount, I probably won't make any difference. The only real difference will be the Earth will have more material on it. Um, I don't know whether that will have a, a difference to anything at all, but, um, you know, mining in space and bringing it back to Earth, that's, it seems a little bit pointless, really. But mm -hmm. I understand why they, you know, in some ways why they want to do it, but uh, mm -hmm. mining in space to be able to go further out in space into space or well, the further they go it's like the Mandelbrot set you you zoom in three times you know seven times and you've zoomed in to the same size of Jupiter for instance um, it's very unlikely because we're we're going around the Sun okay anyway if anybody goes out there and tries to go to a certain point um, you've lost them you're never going to be able to follow that same path anyway so as long as they go out far enough i don't mind them claiming space there's not enough uh, humans on the earth to to worry about it i've actually done a video on my um, youtube channel it's literally called open forum is space mining a good or bad idea and it, li literally it's like open it's only like a minute and a half i introduce the topic a few slides and actually you know invite people tell us what you think you know let's get involved and um you know that is exactly this debate um you know again what i'm trying to do with my video is not to antagonize but it's to you know oh, get people thinking what do you think about this is it good is it bad um for me i look at it as a purely technical avenue i mean the ethical and political side is interesting but i'm an engineer and a scientist first not a politician so i look at it as things like if you had a a lunar colony or a Jupiter mining colony, let's say. Jupiter mining core, Red Dwarf, politics, I leave for much more um, um, erudite politicians to argue the, the whys and the wherefores, but um, 
I look at it certainly from engineering, but again, by all means, get involved with the, um, the online uh, forum video there. That, exactly that, space mining. Something that occurs to me is we've got a planet here that we're not doing very much with, and we've got a, a need to invest to apply a lot of technology to try and remedy the problems we've got of a growing population. We can't control that. We've got re resource depletion. Never will any of these vehicles get the X billion people off this planet to oh, somewhere Robert. safe. So, cheers, Robert. So, you know, rather than reaching further and further out and sort of basically, you know, muddying up other parts of the, of the solar system or the universe, uh, I think we've got a common humanity we've got to actually look after. And um, <clears throat> that means doing more here. And sure, I, I love Apollo. I love all of that sort of stuff because of the technology it develops and you know, taking advantage of the Clark Belt, getting satellites up there so they can work back to Earth and improve our comms. Mm -hmm. Fabulous stuff. Um, but I'm just not confident it makes sense. I think it's a, it's a re... It's a, it's a poorly directed set of resources to keep yeah. on going further and further out yeah. for colonization and other purposes. Mm. Do it for exploration. Mm. That's fabulous. But yeah. colonization, I think, is just losing the point. See, that's, that's an interesting side of the argument because, again, put, being devil's advocate and not being argumentative with you, but others would look at it and say, because it's resource depletion on Earth and with, you know, there's fracking, there's, you know, fossil fuels, all this, why not stop that on Earth, but use other planets which are untouched to extract their resources and leave Earth beautiful and green? Um, again, that's devil's advocate hat. Who would argue space mining is good? Don't, you know, leave Earth alone. Earth is good. A million elsewhere. I think humanity I, needs to mature. I mean, Ross, you make a really good point. We're wrecking this planet. Yeah. And, and the answer is just move off. Well, you know, <laughs> you'll never get everybody off. Yeah, you know, exactly. And you know, maybe, maybe, and it won't be in our lifetimes, but if, if society and civilization came together as a more coherent thing with a set of coherent policies that, you know, benefit people rather than individuals and institutions, maybe then we'd be in a much stronger place to, to decide what to do. Yeah, you know, I'm very hopeful that humanity is going to come around and start doing something about looking yeah. after each other in the planet. Yeah. yeah. And fusion. I mean, fusion is looking yeah. more promising by the day. And if we can get that and any, any electricity storage, then we can do away with the majority of fossil fuel use. And that, that would be wonderful. Singapore is putting a new big solar farm in northern Australia. And I, I've forgotten the dimensions of it, but the, the finished product is going to be something like 150 square kilometers which is many many times the size of Singapore itself and they're putting a big I think liquid sodium battery there and lithium and then a big undersea DC cable back into Singapore huh. and it's going to be capable of actually running the whole lot Whoa. and what I love about that project is the technology that's gone into building that came from space exploration so much of it came from pushing the envelope and doing all these great, great things and going out and having a look around. And yeah, that's why I'm a hundred percent supporter of it. Um, we bring it back and yeah, do it here. I think we need to sort out all our differences first before we can do these things. But in the meantime, <clears throat> yeah, that's what will happen before we colonize, colonize other places or go to other stars. But at the moment, we've got these people like Elon Musk that are testing the waters, you know, and he is being a bit reckless about it. But he's also um, striving like we never saw before, you know, and in time, there'll be someone else who will come, up, come about that will add to him and... You know, it may be in a completely different subject to, to what Elon Musk does, but you need these people, I think, every now and then to be able to, to move us forward. As a closing remark for this video, I'd like to send an enormous thank you to the Cornwall Astronomical Society for letting me talk this evening. I thoroughly enjoyed the end of presentation conversation as well, and there were some really good points made up and questions asked. 
And if you enjoyed this video, then please leave a like and a subscribe and keep an eye out for more content to come in the future. Thank you very much and take care.